a work of art, the image for which was found purely by accident, an exhibit behind which the tears of millions of children are hidden. This was a crime that was hidden for almost an entire century. The National Museum Memorial to Holodomor Victims. Though it was opened only eight years ago in Ukraine, it immediately became widely known for beyond the borders of Ukraine. The exhibits in the museum may not show the greatest artistic skills or be a high price tag, but their value exceeds the most expensive things in the world. After all, they represent the most precious thing that can be appreciated in the world – human life. A round stone, a bronze sculpture of a lean girl is placed on it. When you look at it, you see all the pain that the children experienced during the Holodomor. It is very difficult to express in words the horrible experience and suffering from hunger over endless months. The girl gently presses five spikelets she is holding in her hands into her chest. Her empty eyes are full of pain and fear. This depicts the fear that somebody else will eventually have. The sculpture embodies the fate of children who became innocent victims of the Holodomor in 1932-1933. This girl is one of those one and a half million children at minimum who experienced a horrible death from starvation. The one and a half meter high sculpture called Bitter Childhood Memory is well known to residents of Kyiv and not only to them. It is masterfully executed. Ceremonies of commemoration of the victims of the Holodomor constantly take place near the sculpture according to the state protocol. Foreigners who come to Ukraine lay flowers and put lit candles in front of the sculpture of this girl with spikelets. He voiced this idea, which was then realized by Kyiv sculptor Petro Drozdovsky. We worked with sculptors Mikola Abizukant, Petro Drozdovsky. We constantly discussed different projects and sketched ideas in our workshops, but the girl was born like our childhood. Around the sculpture there are 12 milestones. They surround the square appropriately named the Milestones of Fate. The sad statistics of the Holodomor show that nearly 25,000 people a day died of hunger in Ukraine. Just think about it, 25,000 corpses every day. This square symbolizes this figure in commemoration of the victims. Here, just like on a clock dial, there are 24 stones, which represent 24,000 deaths of innocent Ukrainians. How was this image created? Why does the girl hold exactly five spikelets? And why did one of the largest crimes of the 20th century, the Holodomor, happen? The so-called fifth column of Russia has always been in Ukraine. It remains here to this day. Those people always try to subordinate the Ukrainian state to their sponsor, Russia. The creation of the memorial of to the victims of the Holodomor became perhaps the first signal of Ukraine's withdrawal from the zenith of a country that claims to have nothing to do with the war in the Donbass. However, like the predecessors of that very country, Russia claimed that it had nothing to do with the mass extermination of Ukrainians. But first things first. 
The idea of the memorial was developed after the first degree of President Yushchenko in commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Holodomor. That was in 2005. In 2007, the construction of the memorial complex began. Although the location of the memorial was not chosen right away, the Commission considered completely different locations. A contest was held for erecting a memorial to the Holodomor victims on Volodymyr's Hill. Certain artists were chosen as winners, but imagine a Holodomor memorial next to the monument to Volodymyr the Great. It is preposterous. That's how land was allocated then. Then Primakov Park was considered as a site for this sculpture. Anatoly Haidamaka insistently proposed to build the memorial here in Pechersk. In the end, a decision was made and Haidamaka became the author of the entire complex. Haidamaka offered some sculptural compositions on the territory of the memorial, including the girl that opens up the panorama of the memorial at its entrance to the complex. Indeed, the idea became very successful and was skillfully executed. The sculpture turned out to be so successful that it was replicated. Very soon the girl with five spicolets appeared overseas. She became the symbol of the Ukrainian Holodomor. Now there are two such sculptures in Canada. One of them is in High Park in Toronto, where there stands a monument to Taras Shevchenko. They showed it to me. And the other one? They built a large museum called Museum of Human Rights. The museum is very large and our girl with the spicolets is also there. We're getting ready for another one. There is a plot allocated in Toronto, another one will probably be there. But the first one was installed here, in Kiev. Such a successful sculpture was not created all at once. The trio of masters, Haidamaka, Drozdovsky and Obeshuk, could not immediately find the exact image that would convey the concept. You see, we wanted to make it naturalistic so that she would be very lean. That would have been naturalism. We did not want to step over such line of naturalism, the Holodomor, but like this, through this image. For a long time, brainstorming sessions gave no results. But one day, Petro Drozdovsky called Anatoly Haidamaka as a messenger of some very good news. He found that image purely by accident, somewhere on a beach in Kiev. The prototype of the girl with spicolets was found on the beach. It was an accident, so to speak. But the emotions and the mental state of those whom the sculptors wanted to immortalize in this sculpture were known to them firsthand. The girl was born in the same way as we in our childhood. I recalled myself in my childhood. I survived 1947. There was another famine in the post-war years. My parents and grandparents survived the Great Famine of 1933. We can definitely say today that the Holodomor in Ukraine of 1932-33 was genocide against the Ukrainian people. A well-targeted strategy was developed for the sole purpose of exterminating the Ukrainian nation. Part of that strategy is reflected in the sculpture Bitter Childhood Memory. The girl in the sculpture is holding exactly five spicolets for a reason. Most researchers of the history of the Holodomor consider Joseph Stalin and his gang of murderers the main culprits of this heinous crime of the century. Stalin could not forgive the Ukrainians for their organized resistance to his policy, which began with collectivization of Ukrainian farmlands. The Ukrainians simply could not accept the notions of socialization of property and labor, which was deliberately developed and executed under the leadership of the communist Bolsheviks with the sole aim of destroying the Ukrainian nation. The fact of the matter is that the Bolsheviks viewed the collective farms as a convenient way of pumping out financial resources from the state budget, an effective way of accelerating industrialization to resolve the grain issue and, of course, the elimination of the main enemy of Soviet power, namely the prosperous peasantry. The leaders of the Communist Party spent two years conducting all kinds of theoretical research to justify the need for collectivization and keep the opponents of accelerated collectivization at bay. In response to these efforts, the communist regime in 1930, Ukraine launched a large-scale process of uniting the peasants. 
Those plans for the reconstruction of industry and forced industrialization required the concentration of food resources and raw materials in such economic forms that would allow for quickly and without hindrance extract agricultural products from Ukraine, which can be labeled with bitter sarcasm as the grain drain from Ukraine. For this purpose, the notion mass complete collectivization was conceived. The term mass could be constructed as engaging all the dependent farmsteads in the process and everything that was on those farms, mainly farm machinery, livestock and agricultural products. Complete meant the engagement of adjacent villages, districts and eventually oblasts in the process. But individual peasants did not really want to join those collective farms. To be more precise, they were categorically against this idea. No, we were totally against the idea of joining collective farms. Just imagine, I have everything I need and it's not just me, but every other farmer. Cows, sheep, horses, pigs, plows and apiaries. Suddenly we had to give everything away. How could we just give away all that we survive on? The reluctance of the villagers to join collective farms and the preservation of individual farms was not part of the plans of the communists. So owners of private farms were methodically and persistently forced to give away their livelihood. People were taxed. There were mandatory taxes for everything. We had to give away that much rye, buckwheat, everything. After you pay the tax, you have to pay another one. After you barely manage to do that, you have to pay yet another one. Obviously, it was impossible to fulfill such a plan. Then, the practically broke owners were offered an alternative. So, if you don't want to pay the required taxes, then join the collective farm and we don't touch you. And to boot, we will feed you. But even such sophisticated methods could not always break the strong and obdurate will of farm peasants to resist the authorities. Then they resorted to open violence. For these purposes, the so-called peasant committee of the poor was exploded. If you don't join the collective farm, five or seven activists come to your home. One or two go to your house, another one goes to your farm, the third climbs up into the barn, the fourth one checks out what is in your oven, and the rest of them go into the garden with cranes or sticks to check if you hit something there. If they did not find grain, they took everything edible that they could find, even beans, potatoes and other food products. For example, they came to search our house, but did not find anything. But my father kept bees. He hid a can of honey in a haystack. They started poking it with their sticks and found the can. They took the honey away. So, there you have it. That was the way things happened on collective farms in those years. The decolonization or Soviet campaign of political repressions on Ukrainian farmers was akin to a civil war. After all, Ukrainians and their fellow villagers came to take the last crumbs of bread. We have hobos today, but they existed then. They had no land. But there were not as many then as there are today. It was those bombs. Their souls thrilled, and today we put out their hands asking for clothing, food, something to get drunk on, and so on. In 1930 was the first year of mass collectivization. There were more than 4,000 uprisings that year. There were not just women addressing the local citizens. Old ladies, brain dish and pitchforks, brakes and other farm implements participated in well-organized protests, and they were armed to the teeth. All forces were mobilized to suppress those uprisings, including the army. The Bolsheviks did not even hesitate to open fire against those people whom they deceitfully called their brothers. And machine guns were used on a regular basis. The uprisings were totally and brutally suppressed. Their leaders were arrested and then killed. But the peasant forces of resistance did not stop there. Then Stalin decided to break the resistance by devising a so-called artificial famine to decimate an entire nation, the Ukrainian peasantry. 
watch in the next episode. That is the People's Commissariat of Social Security and the People's Commissariat of Health Care and the regional, local and central authorities did not provide help to the starving peasants. The question is, what exactly were the punitive repressive bodies of power looking at in those years? Very serious processes transpired exactly in the summer of 1932, which confirmed the plan to eliminate, wipe the entire Ukrainian nation off the face of the earth. Corn was unloaded at a railway station, which was guarded by Soviet soldiers. One boy came to take a couple of cups of corn, and he was shot. The soldiers used this corn to distill moonshine and sell it for profit. Переробляли наш спирт.